Hi everyone, welcome to our Land and Environmental Justice Movement White Call. We have a song um, sharing in your screen. You should be able to hear it. But I just wanted to double check, Mosioka, please um, share sound when you um, play the play button in your screen so that we can hear the song. Our moderator for um, our call today is Marlon Manuel. And I hand it over to Sir Marlon to welcome everyone. Thank you. Morning, good afternoon, good evening. Let's let's give it one more try. The the music. Musioka. You know we do this parents of the National Land Coalition. Thank you. Thank you, Musioka, and welcome, everyone. Again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, in whatever time zone you're, uh, you're calling from. We're excited to kick off today's session. My name is Marlon Manuel. I'm with Namati and the Grassroots Justice Network. I'm so excited to be here with you all. Uh, our movement call for, uh, uh, for, for, for tonight, for today. We hope you enjoyed that song by Moses uh, in Kana backed by Mzimba Youth Organization. Uh, the title is Malo, which means land in the local Sewa language. The song is raising awareness on what land means to the youth of Malawi. And the song is also advocating for the reduction and modification of cultural and legal barriers that hinder the youth from accessing and controlling natural resources. And we're inspired every day by our members who are creatively tackling the climate and environmental crisis within their communities. Okay, we're ready to start, but before that, a few announcements, a few administrative announcements. Uh, first, this event will have simultaneous interpretation in English, Spanish, and French. So to activate it, uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar, but uh, just as a reminder, please look for the globe icon at the bottom of your screen. Or if you don't see the globe icon, you look for the three dots and then click on it and then select the language. A few reminders uh, to help our interpreters. Kindly mute your microphones if you are not speaking. And if possible, if you will uh, be unmuting later on, uh, to, to make a beef sharing, please be in a quiet space so we can hear you clearly when you speak. If you have access to a headset, better to use a headset uh, or a microphone. So please use them during the call. When you speak, please speak slowly. So again, uh, we're having interpretation. So it's very important that you speak slowly so we can capture your message. If you are using acronyms, referring to shortcuts, uh, please spell them out for everyone's uh, information. Thank you very much. Uh, later today, we will be moving into breakout sessions, into breakout rooms. So to help us out in putting you in the right group, we request that you rename yourself by adding the name of your language to your name, so to the beginning of your name. So E-N, write E-N for English. 
uh, SP for Spanish and uh, FR for uh, for French. So we are okay. So uh, uh, please rename again. Rename your uh, rename yourself and add uh, your your language. That will help us in uh, grouping together the participants uh, later on for our breakout session. Our movement call for today focuses on participatory action research. So you will hear that term repeated a number of times today. Participatory action research or PAR. We have three network members with us today who will be sharing their own action researches, their own PARs from Chile, from the Philippines, and from Cameroon. We have an exciting discussion ahead, but before before that, before we continue and before we hear uh, from our speakers, we would like to know, we would like to get a sense of how many people in this room are familiar about the term or the concept of PAR or Participatory Action Research. So this will be a, a short icebreaker before we start the, the conversation. So we will be releasing a poll at this time. So you will see a poll asking how much you know about PAR or Participatory Action Research. Okay, so you, you should be seeing the poll now. So please uh, take time and uh, answer the questions. And once we have uh, given enough time, and uh, I see I see more than fifty participants in the room. Currently, we're expecting uh, more participants to join us later. So we're waiting for the responses. We have forty-two percent participated. Okay, let's give it uh, a few more a few more minutes. So I see 60%, more than 60% had uh, responded to the poll. Okay, I still see people voting. Yeah, maybe we can stop... Uh, you, you can continue uh, answering if you're still answering, but uh, we can end the poll and share the results. Okay. Can, can you see the results? Uh, so as we can see on the question of whether you have heard about PAR or participatory action research, we have 45%. 45% uh, choosing option two, saying I've heard of it and have an idea of what PAR is. Uh, and then we have 3% for yes, I use PAR regularly and 25% what what PAR? What are you talking about? <laughs> that's, a, that's an alien concept. Uh, that's an alien concept, which is good because this, this is why we are discussing it. This is why we, are, we want to talk about it. So uh, the, the poll will, will, will give us a sense of where where we are, where participants, uh, where participants us are, we it will help us know where, uh, PAR had been used, has been used, is being used, especially for many of us here working uh, on issues concerning land, environment, and climate and climate issues. Okay, so now we are ready. But before that, uh, just uh, a few reminders. You can use and please, uh, we encourage you to use the, to use the chat. Uh, you can in, introduce yourself, please. Uh, let us know from which country, which organization uh, you are calling from, you are joining the room from. And uh, then if you have comments or questions later on as we proceed with our conversation, uh, please feel free to use the chat uh, box. This is a very short, uh, a very short call. So we want to maximize 
our interaction. So the chat, uh, the chat is one way for us to get comments, to get questions as we uh, proceed with uh, the conversation. Okay, now looking at the mixed results uh, from the poll, we will now demystify and, and learn together about PAR. What does PAR, P-A-R, or participatory action research mean? I'm giving the virtual floor now to Erin Kitchell, uh, Director of Land, Environment, and Climate at NAMATI. Erin also leads the learning agenda, which aims to deepen impact and practice across the legal empowerment field by sharing learning about what works in different contexts, in different areas or regions. The participatory action research projects you will hear from today are taking up this question, this learning agenda question of what works in their own communities. So Erin, uh, let's all welcome Erin and over to you, Erin. Thanks so much, Marlon. And thank you all for joining. I'm really looking forward to the conversation with everyone today. As Marlon said, I'm, I'm just going to start by saying a, a word about the learning agenda for legal empowerment. And this is the, the context in which the network members that you're going to hear from today are, are doing this incredible work um, to really uncover what works. How do we drive change? Um, and maybe, Musioka, I'll ask you to put up the slides. And so the learning agenda for legal empowerment. Over the past five years, network members from across the world came together to identify common priorities for learning. These are the questions that are really at the frontiers for our field, the sorts of questions that no one organization can answer alone. The places where we really need peer exchange and collective inquiry um, to unpack what, what works and how we can best move forward. Um, to, these priorities have been, this is one of the core things of Learning Agenda, this set of questions, which I'll describe, uh, speak to in a moment. Um, and then around those questions, we've been creating spaces for collective reflection. So it's safe spaces where people can share live challenges and hear from each other about ideas for what, what, what they've seen in different contexts and how they can move forward. And then finally, the third thing that really defines the Learning Agenda is just the commitment to documenting and capturing all of that learning and sharing it more broadly um, with network members. So the core, the heart of the learning agenda really is a, a set of questions that are the burning questions that energize us and keep us up at night. Um, next slide, please, Ms. Yoka. And these questions are on four major themes that network members have said are really the focus, needs to be the focus of our own inquiry, shared inquiry across the network. The first uh, questions around building power and systems change. One of the signature opportunities and challenges for our field is how do we translate grassroots efforts to address specific rights violations into reforms that advance justice for everyone? So really looking at the process of combining law and organizing, building community power, and then channeling that towards transformative systems change. The second set of questions are around impact. What have we seen legal empowerment can achieve? And in particular, how is it driving important changes on communities' own sense of agency and ability to make change? And then broader um, changes in systems of governance. And this question is important for all of us to know what works, but also to be able to make the case um, that legal empowerment really needs to be a priority for investment. The third theme and set of questions are around movement infrastructure. What do justice movements need to survive and thrive? And in particular here, two themes that network members have really highlighted. One is around public recognition. So how are legal empowerment efforts, how are grassroots justice workers um, treated and supported in different national contexts? And then second, what are innovative forms of financing that, that are adapted to the sort of organizing and systems change work we do, and also to some of the different difficult political context that many people are working in. And then finally, given what we're seeing around the world, this rise of authoritarianism, there are also a set of questions around closing civic space. How can we counter repression and threats to democracy? And how do we think about um, the opportunity legal empowerment opens up and grassroots justice opens up to deepen democracy, so to 
go beyond um, resisting closing civic space to actually um, supporting a thriving democracy. Uh, next slide, please, Ms. Yoko. So these are, again, those are the burning questions that the learning agenda is really channeling collective focus around. And just wanna say a bit more about what is this looking like? Um, the three panelists uh, that you're gonna hear from today, they are part of a group of network members that are taking up long-term participatory action research projects. So these are um, efforts to really drive learning at the frontiers of legal empowerment on these questions, these themes. And what do we mean by participatory action research? It was actually exciting to see um, how many of you, I think almost 75% uh, of the people that are here today have some sense, are either have done participatory action research themselves or have heard about it and had some exposure. Um, there are really two key ideas that define participatory action research. The first is distinct from any other approach it is centered on communities as partners and as leaders in the research. So they're not the, sub the subjects of the re research, but instead they're really the actors. They are defining the priorities for what we need to learn. They are leading the process of um, collecting information, deciding how that what that means, interpreting it, and then thinking about, well, how do we use it? What can we do with this? And that is the second element that defines participatory action research. It is embedded in specific struggles for justice, and it is explicitly um, aimed towards supporting efforts for social change. Um, so those two elements, communities as partners and leaders in the research, and then using research and learning to drive change. Um, so it's not merely an academic or an abstract exercise, it's really offering a new, another set of tools that grassroots justice efforts can use. And in, in terms of what it looks like in practice, oftentimes um, experimentation is a really big part of this. So legal empowerment programs and grassroots justice efforts act, uh, actively um, trying out new things and capturing that, documenting that in simple ways and then feeding it back into decision-making about what happens next. Um, just a quick word about then what is, what is all this leading to and how is it contributing to richer conversations across the network? Um, one, one example that I'll give on the closing civic space theme, there have been roundtables um, going on about this question, what, what are network members doing to adapt? And that's been feeding conversations in Southeast Asia about, okay, well, how do we feed, use that to um, build stronger programs? How do we think about building potentially an agenda for collective action around this. How can we support each other as we try to resist closing civic space? And then second on land, um, environment, and climate, these projects and broader discussions around the learning agenda in the network are really taking up some of the, the biggest challenges um, that we see in this space. So for example, how can we make good on free prior informed consent? How can we overcome some of the barriers to implementing that in practice? Um, democratizing environmental governance. Where are there um, opportunities to open space for communities to drive decision-making? And then inclusion and gender um, and climate change. How do we think about opening up space for everyone, um, women, men, youth, to drive decisions about how we're responding to climate change? So those are just a couple of examples of themes that are coming up in the learning agenda related to land, environment, and climate. And I want to now pass it uh, back to Marlon and make sure we have time to hear from, again, the, the network members who are really um, taking on leadership on this and doing participatory action research and practice. Thank you very much, Erin, for that uh, very good overview about the learning agenda and uh, participatory action research. And, and remember, not just subjects, but active researchers the key actors, the key players, which is empowerment in essence. So there is really a close uh, a close link between uh, between what you're doing, legal empowerment, the learning agenda for the legal empowerment community, and the participatory action research. And as Erin mentioned, a lot of innovation, a lot of experimentation to improve what we're doing and to learn from each other. So all of these are uh, interconnected uh, principles that bind us together as uh, as a community. So we are now ready to, to proceed to our discussion of some examples of uh, participatory action researches that are 
uh, ongoing, had been partially completed. Our our colleagues are ready to share. Uh, but before that, again, uh, another reminder to please rename yourself. Add your spoken language to the beginning, EN for English, SP for, for Spanish, FR for French. And that will help us place you, assign you in the breakout rooms for, for our discussion later. Another uh, important announcement, if you want to learn more about the learning agenda and participatory action researches, uh, we, will, we will be posting in the chat the link to uh, our website, the, the section on learning agenda, which also includes the discussion on PAR, if you want to learn more about that. Okay? Thank you again, uh, Erin. And with that uh, background, with that uh, uh, framework, let's see how participatory action research is being carried out, how it plays out uh, in, in three countries, in Chile, in Cameroon, and uh, in the Philippines. So I will now introduce our colleagues uh, who will be sharing what they're doing. I'll start with Samuel uh, Nguifo. Uh, welcome, Samuel. Samuel has been working with communities uh, in Cameroon to provide legal support to communities affected by large and small investment on land and natural resources. Samuel directs the Center for Environment and Development, CED, in Cameroon's capital, Yaoundé. In 1999, Samuel was a recipient of the Goldman Environmental Prize. So let's give Samuel a virtual, a round of virtual advice, uh, 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 applause. Uh, Samuel, uh, good afternoon. Next. Good afternoon, Manuel. Thank good you. Good afternoon, Samuel. Uh, next, uh, I will introduce Jerty uh, or Griselda Mayo Anda. We call her Jerty. Jerty is based in the Philippines. Uh, she's an environmental lawyer and she has been working in environmental advocacy and community based resource, resource management for, uh, for several years. She established the Environmental Legal Assistance Center, or ELAC, E L A C, in 1990. And ELAC is one of the Philippines' most active NGOs working to empower communities and local stakeholders to protect the environment and natural resources. And last, Macarena Martinic. Macarena works with communities in promoting their access to environmental justice. She has been working with, uh, with, with FEMA, an organization in Chile, litigating in favor of territorial causes. FEMA's efforts have been instrumental in uh, advancing progressive environmental jurisprudence in Chile. So thank you, Samuel, Jerty, and Bacarena for, uh, for joining and for, for leading our discussion uh, for today's movement call. Maka, Jerte, and Samuel will be sharing stories about uh, the research that they are doing in their respective organizations together with partner communities and partner organizations. And through uh, their presentations, they will be sharing how they are using PAR, Participatory Action Research, to deepen their impact on land, environment, and climate issues. So again, uh, may I remind you to feel free to use the chat so that you can uh, post comments or if you have questions or clarifications about the research projects, uh, please post them in the in the chat. Okay, so we are ready to we are ready to start. I I, I don't see I don't see Samuel, but uh, I think Samuel can can hear us. And I I heard Samuel earlier, so uh, we'll, we'll sure. okay we'll we'll proceed now. I'll, uh, I, I have a, a number of, of questions for our three colleagues. I'll start with the first, uh, with the first question. And, and this is just to request you to tell us a story about uh, environmental injustices that the communities that you work with, you accompany, uh, face. And how you, you are, you and your organization, how you are supporting them uh, through legal empowerment. I'll, I'll start with Jerty. Okay. Good Dirty. evening, everyone. Good evening, everyone. Mabuhay, as you say in the Philippines. Uh, the story I'd like to focus on is on extractives, mining. Um, for more than 30 years, I've seen how communities in this beautiful province called Palawan, the last ecological frontier, have been battling with uh, mining. Um, and it's, 
it's ironic that we have uh, we have special laws uh, governing forest like this protected area but it is subjected to mining now this is also ancestral domain and um, 25 indigenous community farmer and fisher members including women are currently um, being sued by the mining company for rallying uh, and asserting the rights against the mining companies and we are defending them. So you can see in this photograph how proud they are of the old growth forest, the big trees, uh, which are part of their domain, and yet they have been displaced. So even if we have laws on free and prior informed consent, because we have an Indigenous Peoples' Rights Act, the process has been marred by irregularities. Even if the Philippines has a lot of laws, protecting our old growth forest and natural forest, but the nickel mining companies have been given special tree cutting permits uh, to cut 52,000 trees in one area, 27,929 trees in another area, and thousands more. So here, mining continues to operate and to the best that we can, we do our legal empowerment intervention, the capacity building, strategic litigation, and also local advocacy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jerty, uh, for that, and thank you for for sharing all those uh, all those pictures. I'll now call on Samuel uh, to to share what they are doing in Cameroon. Uh, thank you. you. Okay. Can you and, and again, uh, before be, before Samuel uh, Samuel starts, uh, for those who uh, who just joined us, we we have interpretation, uh, English, Spanish, and French. So please uh, activate your uh, your Zoom interpretation uh, function, and Samuel uh, will be speaking in French. Okay. Good. Uh, I was planning to speak in English, but I think French will be easier. Euh, bonjour à tous. Le projet que nous faisons au Cameroun est un projet qui se passe dans la zone côtière, à côté de l'océan Atlantique, dans une région qui s'appelle le département de l'océan. Et... I have a message saying I have changed my language. Uh... Should I continue in French or in English? Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you now. Samuel, go ahead, please. I have a message saying that I have to confirm my language because in the registration, I said English. So I don't know if I continue in English or French. Will this matter? No, uh, no, no. no. Uh, please, please go ahead and uh, continue in French. Okay, perfect. Donc, c'est une région qui s'appelle le département... So, this is a region that is called the Ocean Department. It's on the Atlantic Ocean. And... It has been exposed to the colonization since the very early years of colonization. It's been over 150 years of exploitation in terms of the use of the wood or the use of the lands for the different industries and big plantations, but also in terms of the conservation for the forest and its resources for big companies. Um, there is a great diversity of population. We have uh, especially uh, farmers and um, also local communities that we called the pygmies. This is a very dis um, insulting term, so to speak, uh, because these are communities that are simply connected to the land and to the resources there. We have seen many investments there because it's full of different resources and we see many uh, forest exploitation and different um, crops, and we see more and more uh, mining uh, activities. The surface that the state has given to this area is beyond the number of hectares that uh, covers the region. So this is what the state has uh, attributed to these investments. This promotes the conflicts that uh, are coming up in the area.
Thank you, Samuel. So from Central Africa, we now go to Latin America. So I will call on Maka uh, from FEMA, from Chile, uh, to share what they're doing. Gracias, Marlon. Nuestro... Thank you, Marlon. Our participatory action research is focused on collaboration with local communities in the Magallanes region. Among them, we're working with the Cahuesca communities, the indigenous communities. The Magallanes region is a, a Chilean region. However, the Cahuesca community knows it as the Cahuesca Was region. It's the most southern region uh, in the country. And for thousands of years, the Cahuesca communities have sailed in around and navigated around these areas. As you'll be able to see on the map, it's very fragmented. There are many different fords in the Pacific Ocean. And that is why for a long time, the Cahuesca communities have navigated and interact interacted with this area. Uh, the Cahuesca communities that we work with are called Cahuesca communities that defend the sea because uh, the process that we're working on is a process of saving these natural resources that are being lost increasingly. Uh, we're, we work on the close link that they have with the sea, and uh, it's a way of classifying the reality with this uh, link that they have, the spiritual link that they have to the territory, to the sea, and the identification of sacred sites or for areas that can't be passed through. And in this process of uh, rescuing or protection that we are working on with the Kawaska communities, uh, we've been carrying out a kind of a com a a accompanying process. It also involves legal empowerment. What we're doing is constantly uh, giving over tools with which they can improve their knowledge and protection of the space. And we also do a lot of strategic litigation. The threat in this region today, and you can see the region on the screen now, it's a beautiful region. Perhaps many of you have heard of Patagonia. This is in uh, Chilean Patagonia. There is an Argentinian Patagonia as well, but this is in Chilean Patagonia. And the main threat in the region today is salmon farming. And at the moment, salmon farming has been expanding in the Magallanes region. Salmon farming in Chile is an industry that farms an exotic species. It's not an indigenous species to Chile, and that's why it's having a huge impact. And it's having a huge environmental impact when it comes to uh, pollution, the chem chemicals that are being used, the seafloor is being destroyed. And we're seeing a lot of new industries coming in, especially foreign companies that are coming in, invading our cities that, of course, aren't, weren't built for this amount of people. And they're kind of touristic cities. And you can see that some of the photos here as well. Uh, us in the communities, uh, in the litigation process, and them sailing, navigating around these places. We've worked with focus groups as well to uh, dig out information, particularly in the region, in the ground, in the lands, and about what they want to target action towards as well. Thank you. Thank you, Maka. Gracias. Very beautiful pictures, no? Forest, land, peace uh, from, from Asia to Africa and Latin America, but unfortunately all threatened. No? All threatened. Uh, very beautiful areas, but all threatened. Uh, I will now go to the, the, the issue that we have for, uh, for the focus of our conversation, PAR or PAR, Participatory Action Research. And the question for, for our three colleagues is this. What, what is the issue? What is the question that you are investigating? What is the point of inquiry that, the, that, that you have uh, through your Participatory Action Research Project? And and in specifically, why PAR? Why did you choose participatory action research as uh, as an initiative, as a strategy to 
to learn about that particular issue, to inquire about that that question. I will start this time with uh, with Samuel. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, loud and clear. Samuel, go ahead. Okay, okay, perfect. Uh, quelle est la question qui nous a préoccupé? Pourquoi What's nous the avons question that you was, uh, cette, uh, that, sur, sur ce cool. sujet? That, what were the concerns about this subject, about the participatory action, about the PAR? We have to say that we work in the zone in different, in different, different years, and we, we, we work in the question of the committees against the big investors. And what we try to do is to reinforce the juridical capacity, the legal capacity of the communities but today we 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 say we say it, there is a lot of investments against us and we can't work in any in not every communi community but we, so we uh, need to go to who, the which are the communities the, that are more at risk, risk of, conflict. of conflict we need to foresee and we have uh, to check where are, are the places where, where we can have, uh, where we can have any sort of complex we, we are, conflict we're having we're hearing two interpretations the in, in the English channel. It's not working. Uh, okay, it's, it's working now. Again. Samuel. Okay, Samuel. I was saying that with the several num the increase in the investments, we do not have the capacity of going everywhere and working with every single community. We needed to determine in a very precise manner which are the areas that are more at risk of conflict and which are the conflict the areas that are um, that are more bound to see conflict. The second thing is that we didn't have any the impression of having well understood what the conflicts were about. We understand that there were conflicts between the different uh, community be, between the communities and the investors, investors. But the communities do not have one single opinion. So it was very important to try and understand what was the position, what was the understanding of the different participants of the community when it came to uh, conflict. Uh, uh, were the young people thinking the same as the elderly? Uh, for instance, it was Im important to understand what the nuances were in order to understand what could be the best course of action in that context in order to prevent conflict and if the case uh, required it in order to work with the communities uh, to solve the conflict. So that was our main purpose, to identify the methods and the requirements in order to work hand in hand with the communities. Thank you, uh, Samuel. Thank you for that. Uh, I'll now call on Maka. What issues are you investigating through the PAR? And why, why PAR in particular? Oui, maintenant je vais appeler Maka. Quelle, quelle question vous êtes en train yes. de, 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 sur lesquelles questions well, vous recherchez par, At FEMA, we divide our RAP. goals into nous, nous external and internal goals. Interne et externe. Regarding the external interne, goals, what we're doing is we're trying uh, to uh, research. Excuse me, Maka. Uh, uh, in just, uh, we are hearing the French interpretation in the English channel. Okay, let's, let's, let's try again. Super. Okay, I'll start again. So at FEMA, we divide our goals and our questions into two different categories, internal and external. Because of what I'm going to because of why PAR. With our external goals, one of our goals is to find evidence that uh, answers the following questions. What has the impact been of legal processes that we and FEMA are carrying out with the communities that we're working with in the Magallanes region? What have the legal empowerment processes impact been? And what's the perception of these legal empowerment processes? What are the tools that uh, the communities have learned to use throughout this process? and which have been most useful for their defense processes. And then the second uh, question has to do with how the 
legal empowerment processes and the facilities can help them to stand up to these threats and future threats. We also have some questions focused on how these legal em empowerment processes have led to changes in their realities as well. I didn't discuss the future threats at the beginning, but the region is facing an imminent uh, installation or establishment of an industry, which is the green hydrogen industry. And many different Latin American countries are competing in this race for green hydrogen and being the biggest producer of green hydrogen. It, honestly, green hydrogen is a kind of false energy solution. So it supposedly contributes to decarbonization, but it's created a lot of questions and doubts as well, because it's actually serving the energy transitions of the countries of the global north. And we've had different international companies entering our territories. And in this case, uh, the impact has been very concentrated in the Magallanes region because there's a great deal of wind in the Magallanes region and green hydrogen needs renewable energy uh, to operate. And that's why there's so much that have arrived in the Magallanes region because there's so much wind. So there's great opportunity for wind energy. And in the north, there's a lot of sun and so there'll be lots of green hydrogen projects in the north as well because of the solar energy potential there. Now, we are also researching and finding proof on an internal goal, which has to do with our uh, own uh, strengthening of our FEMA organization. In FEMA, we have carried out within our work accompanying the Magenis region and with other local organizations. We've been working on a legal empowerment process there in order to defend the land and res natural resources there. And regarding the challenges that we faced and the opportunities that we've identified in this legal empowerment process, uh, are all, these are all related to why PAR. In our case, we've been working for legal, with work, legal empowerment processes for a long time, but we haven't always had the time to stop and think about how we do these legal empowerment processes in our organization. And the PAR that we're carrying out now has allowed us to stop and reflect, even within the methodologies and the evidence finding uh, that we're doing. When thinking about what we're doing, this has had to do a lot with the different processes of the organization, what was done before, what's being done now, what we'd like to improve on in a way that we can really uh, systematize these processes and have a better understanding, a better presence, uh, so to put it, uh, in these legal empowerment processes and uh, extend and expand their impact as well. We could hopefully extend them to other communities and uh, do it in a more conscious way because often um, we were focusing at uh, uh, things on a case-by-case -case basis, the obstacles that we were coming up against in the specific territories, but we weren't thinking about beyond that. So that's another reason for using the PAR process in our case. Thank you, uh, Maka. Thank you for sharing what you're doing. So we now go to Jerti. Jerti, uh, what are the questions or key issues that you're investigating through your part? Okay, when we pursued the participatory action research, it was part of a network effort, the alternative law groups, and ELAC was a part of that. So we were pursuing that with other public interest law groups, and we took a hard look into the three aspects of legal empowerment, which is one, paralegal and capacity development of communities. Second is on policy reform and advocacy. Third is on strategic litigation. And we wanted to know the impact of our work. So the processes involved were critical. We conducted focus group discussions involving communities. So their voices uh, will be recorded and will be heard, and they will be given the chance to also you know, to f identify what would be most memorable uh, with respect to paralegal development, 
or strategic litigation or policy reform. I have uh, a few photos and slides showing that a group of farmers in uh, Kalatigas, Nara, who was part of the PAR, who were part of the PAR, um, and they were part of our public interest litigation, um, and we, par we partially won the case against the mining company uh, a few years ago. And uh, it was good to see that until now, even if the case has taken on like 10 years, it's pending before the Supreme Court of the Philippines, they are still there waiting and asserting their rights as farmers to their farmland. Their farms were inundated with nicolaterite and therefore uh, through the focus group discussions and also um, key informant interviews, we had the opportunity to reflect on to what extent was the impact um, done, how we were successful and what we could learn. Another important um, area was a case study on the One Palawan um, plebiscite. There was a proposal to divide this last ecological frontier, the province of Palawan into three by politicians and um, applying again legal empowerment uh, strategies, we identified um, what were the gains, what were the gaps, the deficiencies, the challenges, um, the challenge that COVID brought us and now we were able to um, overcome this. So the community spoke that it was very important to use social media because that was COVID time and also important to still sustain the one-on-one -on -one, um, you know, gathering of communities and also the role of lawyers. Simplifying the knowledge of the law, simplifying the rights, and we are proud to say that we won the plebiscite uh, where majority of the people here rejected the plan to divide Palawan. The farmers, the fishers, the indigenous peoples voted and it was a very inspiring story. So that method through a case study where we combined uh, focus group discussions, interviews, taking a look at documents um, provided us valuable lessons. Thank you. Thank you, Jerti. And uh, based on the, the sharing, we are we're inquiring into or learning about uh, many different aspects of our work. As Macarena said, we are reflecting. Even after uh, doing the work for several years, we are stopping and uh, having time to reflect. Uh, is, is our work effective? Uh, what is the impact of our work? How are we doing uh, our, our strategies? How can we improve? Uh, and, and how are we relating? How are we communicating with... Uh, with our partner uh, partner communities and 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 what lessons can we learn uh, from there? We we will now go into uh, the final question for our three colleagues, and I'll start with uh, Maka this time. And uh, Maka, uh, can you share an insight or new evidence that has emerged or is emerging from your research project that would be helpful for? Uh, other colleagues or other uh, other organizations, especially those who are working on land, environmental, and uh, climate justice issues. Maka? Sí, gracias, Marlon. Yes, eh, thank you, Marlon. In fact, right here with me, I have a report that we did. It's the uh, a report on the results of several interviews we held, and we'll be sharing that with the network. Uh, so watch out for that. And we put together this report uh, by, from information that we got gathered from various different sources, not only interviews, uh, but uh, talking to communities that are uh, participating in this legal empowerment process. Um, what, there are several things I'd like to share with you. The first is that indeed these legal empowerment processes are are seen as being very useful for the communities in order to better know the laws, to be able to better use the laws. And some even said that they'd been able to change certain realities. And uh, some indigenous communities did say that there was uh, a lot of work to be done to really achieve that notion of change, but uh, it, 
the legal empowerment process had helped to make progress in that sense. Another thing, it, we found that it really does have to be a process because at first, with the first uh, context that we had, the first pieces of work we did the communities, uh, it was like we were speaking different languages with the communities because also as lawyers, we start learn as we go how to better communicate, how to better collaborate as well because, well, in my case, for example, I'm a lawyer and many of my colleagues in our organization are lawyers, not all of them, but it's often us lawyers who are participating in this legal empowerment process and the collaboration with communities in that process. But along the way, we were kind of unlearning these complicated legal words and we started learning how to really create common dialogue around these legal tools and these uh, litigations even. And they realized that at the end of the day, they felt like they were kind of lawyers themselves because uh, they really found that the knowledge was much more accessible to them. Another thing I'd like to share that was wonderful is that uh, the legal empowerment processes allowed them to equate their knowledge to other types of knowledge uh, that had been traditionally valued or overvalued or put in a hierarchical comparison with other uh, types of knowledge such as, I don't know, legal knowledge, scientific knowledge, other types of very technical knowledge. These kinds of knowledge have generally been looked at as being truer, let's say, or having more value. So this process allowed us to really put uh, the territorial knowledge and their knowledge, their experience at the same level as having the same value as this more technical knowledge. Another relevation for us, uh, which was pretty interesting that came out of our research was that uh, we found the impacts from a gender perspective and how they're perceived by indigenous communities in particular. Uh, they are perceived very differently as well by indigenous women we uh, have been trying to get closer to research, applying a gender perspective to our research. We asked questions about gender and we realized, or we received not exactly a rejection, but a kind of disconnect with the communities. They were like, what are you talking about? Uh, for me, gender has never been anything that's important here. We divide tasks in our communities. We don't establish gender hierarchies. And then uh, through a more uh, a deeper conversation process, we realize that they don't view gender as something that's relevant to their process of defending their territories. Although perhaps they could see that uh, there are unequal gender structures and hierarchies and that perhaps Yes, there is a different burden of care between the genders, but it's not something that for them is some, very relevant in their territorial defense processes. And not like other factors such as um, in the community, the fact that it's the women who are maintaining a certain structure. They are taking on this role of maintaining the community united, uh, in, engendering this idea of the community being a family. And the fact is that for them, they are not environmental defenders, they're families above all, but at, this, at the moment they find themselves at risk. And women uh, shoulder that burden of, or that role of maintaining this family, this community united. And in that sense, uh, gender inequalities were viewed from a different perspective by them. And finally, in our, participatory action research. Well, we were focused on what tools had been used in the defense processes against the salmon fishing processes and how they've been used or how they can be used to counter this new threat, which is the green hydrogen that I mentioned. So uh, this um, participatory action research is something that is being lived in the region and uh, the information that we have gathered looks at identifying common ground 
um, and why the Magallanes region continues to be such a hotspot for industrial processes, uh, such a hotspot for uh, companies setting up there, and what is the common ground that we can identify among these different communities and local organizations, and how this common ground can then help us in the future to resist new threats in the region. Thank you, uh, Maka. New threat, <laughs> emerging threats, new threat, uh, but also emerging uh, new insights. Samuel, uh, I'll call on you. Uh, if you can share any insight, any new evidence coming out of the research project. Samuel? Samuel, uh, you you are your mic is on mute. Okay. Oh, okay. Okay. Now we Thank can you. hear you. Yeah, go ahead, okay. please. Thank you. Ce que nous avons compris en étudiant la question des investissements. What I understood by studying the investors. Les, les, les and les avec the les communautés. assessments that we made with the communities. Nous savions que la question we de la, knew that la situation the question financière, of the land rights and the land scarcity, the saturation of the land was a real important reason for conflict. What we have understood working with the communities is, first of all, that this saturation was not only measured by the surface area, that is taken by the investors. It is not measured by the volume of the uh, wood or other resources that are exploited by investors. Um, but we could instead have other metrics. We could use other tools, other elements that could allow us to measure the scarcity and the key there is the usage, uh, the uh, level of use that a community does of a certain resources could give you a better impression. The more they use these resources, the more bound this community is to have conflicts due to the scarcity of the resources. For instance, if we're talking about uh, 5,000 hectares surface and there's um, a 10 hectares area that is sacred, it's not a big surface, but this amount, uh, this area will give uh, place to conflicts due to the its very nature as a sacred land. Also, when we ask the communities to work with uh, groups that uh, have uh, a diversity of members with women and men, we always talked about the same things. Is there a conflict? What is the reason for the conflict? And we understood that there were different understandings of the de conflicts depending on who's me who, what member was talking about this conflict. So uh, we asked them to share the different perceptions. And then we got the impression that the community uh, starts to understand each other much better. And we realized that there was a sort of misunderstanding within the community before. Now, with this dialogue, each participant could understand what others thought, and this contributed to preventing conflicts within the very communities. Thank you, Samuel. And finally, Jerti, uh, any new insights, new evidence emerging from the project? Okay. Um, I, I'd like to, again, focus on the three aspects of legal empowerment that we, uh, that was part of our uh, participatory action research on power legal development and capacity development of community leaders. Um, they were pleased that there was recognition um, and they knew about the processes related to governance. I also like to build on what Maka earlier said, the significant role of women in uh, local governance in their own community and how they have contributed to their advocacy, asserting their rights to natural resources, including community-based resource management. Um, and then the, but the power legals realized that while laws are important, 
laws are only as good as their implementation. So um, they know that there are laws, but it is not enough that you know the laws exist. That means vigilance is very, very important so that you can compel people from government to do their job. So it was not simply just a matter of knowing what the law laws are or knowing the rights, but they said that mm -hmm. It was important that they continue to be vigilant. And that brings me to the next aspect on advocacy and policy reform. Because uh, on the One Palawan campaign, it was COVID. And we learned that traditionally, we had to go to the far-flung communities to talk to them in person, simplify the law, talk about their rights. But we could not travel because it was COVID time. So we had to use social media and um, you know, even like minimal equipment like power banks and the mobile Wi-Fi. And we recorded ourselves in, you know, this uh, USBs and we distributed them to the communities because we could not travel freely during that time. For us, that was very good. It was an opportunity to combine, you know, traditional strategies of, you know, education uh, on the ground. And then um, how can you effectively uh, broaden the campaign and make people understand about the, the nature of the campaign and the importance to their land and natural resources. And then lastly, on strategic litigation, I think we learned that sustaining the processes um, should be part of our reflection as always, because not always would communities become resilient. They get frustrated that it takes 10 years Example, for a mining case, which we won in the trial court, and then we went to the appellate court and won. And still now, after 10 years, it is pending in the Supreme Court. So they continue to ask that, is litigation really the answer? Or could we, could we have done better? So I think, what should be the sustaining strategies? How, um, when you combine litigation and then advocacy, um, should it be issue specific or do we do should we take stock of the changes in a locality and policy as well it, at a given time? Because right now they also deal with a lot of the climate challenges. So I think um, it's a continuing challenge to reflect on uh, what would be sustainability mechanisms and approaches. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Zerti. And again, uh, we would like to thank uh, our three colleagues. Uh, Samuel, uh, did, we, did we lose Samuel? Samuel there. Samuel, uh, Maka, and Zerti. And uh, take note uh, that we will be continuing the conversation and we will be sharing the, the results. Take note that these are all ongoing. Ongoing research projects. And once completed, uh, Maka said uh, they're they will be releasing some documentation. Uh, we will be sharing uh, outputs of the research projects, not only from uh, from the three organizations, but other organizations also engage in similar uh, research projects uh, through our website, uh, through the, the Learning Agenda page, and also through our newsletters. If you have not yet uh, subscribed to the LEJ uh, newsletter, please do so. We will... We will uh, talk more about that uh, later, but uh, we will continue updating you. And uh, I saw a comment, a question in the chat uh, asking if they can reach out to the three organizations. Uh, so if it's okay with you, uh, Maka, Jerty, Samuel, if we can share your email addresses in the chat uh, later so that uh, yes. if they want to learn more about what you're doing, they can reach out to you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Thank you very much. And, and that brings us now to the breakout session. We are now ready. We will be having a, a very brief uh, breakout session, about maybe about 12 minutes. And uh, we just want uh, participants, and we have more than 70 participants, to think about uh, what had been shared by Samuel, Jerty, and Maka, and, and think about one to two key takeaways. What what did you get out of the out of the sharing? What are your key reflections? And uh, do you see any parallels, any similarity with with the work that you are doing in your organization in your country? 
if you have uh, learning questions or issues you want to inquire into, you want to investigate, what would that question be? What would that issue be? So uh, we would like to bring you into small breakout rooms for, for you to share. Again, one to two key takeaways from what have been shared. Second, do you see any parallels with your work? And then third, what learning question uh, would you be interested, would you be keen to explore uh, through a participatory action research? Uh, are we ready with uh, our breakout, uh, breakout room? We will see. Time is too short. <laughs> I I I was looking at the I was looking at the the rooms and uh, I'm I'm seeing microphones are still open and still active, but we had to we had to close the breakout rooms uh, for for a very short uh, plenary session. And uh, let's start by 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 going back to uh, a couple of questions in the chat. And uh, I um I don't know. Jerty, Maka, or Samuel, please feel free to uh, to choose whichever question you would like to address. Uh, I'll I'll combine two questions. One is about the time needed. How how long does a participatory action research take uh, to be completed? That's that's the first one. And then uh, the second one asks about the issue of uh, protection. Uh, does the participatory action research does the system or does the process allow or include protection, protection of activists from the community? Uh, so anyone, uh, Jerty, Maka, Samuel, feel free to feel free to uh, to choose uh, which question you 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 would like to address. Samuel. Yes. Maybe Go ahead. the question on protection. Les, quand on parle de recherche participative, l'objectif c'est de d'augmenter le pouvoir d'une communauté face à un autre acteur qui peut être l'État ou la compagnie. Donc on intervient dans le jeu de pouvoir et ça peut être dangereux. Uh, embed ourselves in these games of powers uh, in this in order to increase the power of the community. This obviously entails certain risks for the leaders of the communities. So we need to find the best way of protecting these leaders. So what we do from the very beginning is we talk to journalists so that this problem is, is quickly known by the general public. Now, when this problem is well known by the uh, big, than the, by the public, the people, in the community are automatically protected by this. Uh, if there are other dangers entailed by this, we look for different uh, solutions. We try to find the root cause of this danger, and then we start working on it. Thank you, Samuel. Uh, on the question of the, the, the time needed for PAR, Maka, Jerti, Jerti, yes, go ahead. Yeah, well, um, it takes months uh, from our experience uh, we were given at least six months, but the case study, Volume and Palaan, took another additional months. It was time-bound because, of course, the resources, and we were doing other things. Um, that's why I was saying it's not, it's not that easy to, you know, um, schedule focus group discussions because committee members also had the work to do. But um, they were thankful that they were given the opportunity to be you know, to participate in the in the process. Thank you. Thank you, Maka. I have I have another question for you. I saw one question uh, in the chat just now, uh, and I heard you say something about strategies. You're looking at the strategies, how you connect with communities, and and the question is whether uh, you are also looking at how government how government officials respond to legal empowerment uh, strategies. Is that something that is included in uh, in your project? Gracias. Um, la... Thank you. One of our external goals of research is to identify which decision-making spaces the communities that are participating in these 
uh, legal empowerment processes and using the tools, how they can participate in those spaces, how they can have an influence over those decisions that are being made. Um, this is a kind of live investigation or research rather. So it changes with what's happening and with what we're viewing, especially uh, it's the same as what Gertie and Samuel were saying. In our case, um, we gave ourselves a time period of three years, but at the end of the day, the legal process is a lot longer. And at this moment in particular, we've seen certain narratives. Uh, we've seen them really entrench themselves, uh, narratives that stigmatize environmental defense work, narratives that stigmatize um, work of certain international organizations, and these, these are discourses that come from industry, but they've also been internalized or in some cases internalized and in some cases uh, it's just that the state hasn't been able to respond to them. So we're very, we're paying a lot of attention to that and we're looking at how our action as well can respond to those kind of situations. Thank you, uh, Maka. Uh, I'm looking at the time. We have a few, very few remaining minutes. Uh, so if there is any anyone who would like to share, there's a very, very short sharing of uh, some reflections coming from the breakout sessions. Anybody from the from the seven uh, from the seven groups? No one. Hola. Buenos Hola. Días. Hola, Hello. Dana. Hello, Dana. Hello. Good morning. Yes, I'm Dana Ruiz. I'm from Argentina. I would just briefly like to share what we discussed in our small group. And uh, something that interested me was uh, looking at how. Uh, research uh, was being carried out for legal empowerment and via uh, research with CONICET, a research that was carried out on social resistances and how different groups, groups that are called social resistances, uh, that don't necessarily have the same ideology, but come from different perspectives in society, how they can exert a certain social pressure in order to elicit responses from the government. It's a very interesting area of work. Uh, I can share where I, the source of where I found it uh, later on. I've been looking at that uh, because I want to see how can I get communities to see how important it is uh, to create private natural reserves and uh, nature reserves. And once they've been established uh, beyond the environmental impact that they might have, uh, the preservation on the preservation side of things, um, it would also be a good idea to use them as tools, uh, as defense tools against mining companies. Um, and this was discussed a lot in the group as uh, uh, indigenous community defense. This also helps when it comes to creating nature or natural reserves, reserves and uh, something that we need to get communities to really value as well. Uh, we see it as a point of strength and uh, different social actors perhaps could come together to promote preservation for different purposes, let's say. Uh, for example, a nature reserve uh, has the purpose on the one hand of defending, preserving the environment. These, I'm talking about private nature reserves. The owner of the area uh, has the purpose of preserving the environment in the reserve and then actors in the communities. Uh, for example, in the case of where I am in Cordoba, we're looking at adventure tourism, ecotourism. And so uh, they 
the actors in that area and civil actors in that area will also be interested in what we're doing in that sense. Gracias, uh, gracias, Dana. Thank you, Dana. Uh, for, for that. And unfortunately, we are running out of time. But uh, again, we are sharing the email addresses of Jerti, Maka, and Samuel in the chat. So if you, uh, if you want, if you have more questions about their research projects, uh, please, uh, please feel free to reach out to them. You can also reach out to us if you want to know more about PAR. If you have some suggestions uh, or or uh, on on the key questions uh, so that we can continue uh, discussing discussing this uh, we are about to end our uh, movement call and uh, i'm happy to announce that our next movement call will be focused on gender gender equality gender justice uh, and we will now be launching a poll uh, to to seek your input uh, and to ask you what you want to see in the next movement call that is focused that will focus on gender. So now uh, you can see the poll. Please, uh, please vote. While okay. the poll is oh go ahead, Sir Marlon. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Dicky. While the poll is ongoing, I would just like to flag that if you are interested in following along the conversations, we have uh, sent a link in the chat for a uh, registration form for a working group. The Land and Environmental Justice Initiative has three working groups, um, and you can see it in the link. We have also a newsletter. And if, of course, you're um, keen to hear how the research projects are going to turn out, you will hear it in our newsletter. We've also pasted the link in the chat. My colleagues will paste the French and the Spanish version um, as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you, Nikki. So those are different pathways, different opportunities for uh, for you to uh, continue interacting uh, with uh, other network members. So as Nikki, as Nikki mentioned, uh, we will have the next uh, movement-wide call uh, on September 12th uh, on gender. We are continuing to convene uh, the working groups and uh, you have in the chat information about that and also the newsletter. Uh, we'll be uh, providing updates about the par and about uh, other other uh, other initiatives uh, through our newsletter uh, so please register please subscribe uh, to the newsletter and uh, unfortunately we have to close uh, we have spent the the last one and a half hours to together discussing participatory action research in the field of land environment climate uh, Climate justice. We thank everyone. Thank you, uh, uh, Jerti, Maka, Samuel, for sharing uh, your your uh, participatory action research projects. Thank you to our uh, interpreters, and of course, thank you for all participants for joining us here today and engaging and asking questions. Uh, we always run out run out of time uh, uh, every time we we. Uh, we have movement calls. Uh, thank you for all the ideas, all the comments and suggestions. Uh, we hope you found this an, inter an enriching, interesting discussion about participatory action research. And we look forward to continuing the conversation with you and building a stronger movement together and uh, reflecting with each other and learning uh, together and learning from each other. Again, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And thank see you, you in the next... See you in the next movement call. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Merci beaucoup, merci beaucoup.